creator. Now, one way to get a sense of the meaning of the Arabic word rahma is to look at its derivation, as Ibn Arabi and others often do. Rahma, mercy, compassion, is an abstract noun designating the qualities and characteristics of a concrete noun. The concrete noun is Rahim, which means womb. Rahma signifies all the traits associated with the womb and the mother. The mother never ceases being her children's womb. And the specific sort of love that she has for the fruit of her womb is analogous to the mercy that the All-Merciful has for his creation. The Prophet himself makes the point. According to him, this is a famous saying, God divided mercy into 100 parts. And in creating the universe, he kept 99 parts for himself, and he gave one part to the universe. Through that one part, mothers take care of their children and wild animals guard their young. After the resurrection, God will reunite that one part with the 99 parts. Ibn Arabi often talks about this hadith. Let me just quote you one passage in which he explains something of its implications. I quote, Once the day of resurrection has come, and once God's judgment, decree, and determination, by means of this one mercy, have penetrated the whole universe, and once the calling to account has been completed, and the people have taken up their dwelling places in the two abodes, paradise and hell. Then God will add this one mercy to the 99 mercies, so there will be 100. He will send down mercy unconditionally upon his creatures in the two abodes, so it will pervade and embrace everything. Now one might conclude from the various discussions of Rahma in Islamic texts that it designates God's love for creation. And this is true enough. However, we need to keep in mind that the Quran and Muslim thinkers draw a clear distinction between Rahma and Hub or Muhabba. That is between mercy and love. This is because mercy is unidirectional. Mercy comes from God to human beings, not the other way around. People can be merciful and compassionate to each other, but they cannot be merciful to God. Now, as for love, it is bidirectional. The Quran says, I quote, He loves them, God loves people, and they love Him. Now, this verse which affirms the mutual love of God and man, lies at the heart of the tremendous stress that is found in Sufism generally, as for example in Rumi. Now the reason that Sufism gives love a special rank should be fairly obvious. The goal of lovers is to become one. God loves man and man loves God. God created the universe out of love for human beings. God is man's lover, and as man's lover, he wanted man to love him in return. Hence, God sends messages of love through the prophets. Shamsi Tabrizi, Rumi's famous teacher, said that the Quran is a love letter from God. Ishq, no, me, for those of you who know Persian. On the human side, we can only achieve fulfillment in our lives when we recognize that the only thing that we truly love is God. Because God alone is truly real. As Aristotle affirmed already, and as the Muslim philosophers insisted, all creatures are in fact in love with God, whether they know it or not, because he alone designates what they truly desire. 
Now, Tawheed expresses the point succinctly with the formula, there is no beloved but God. Moreover, God loves human beings, so he's the lover. That means that there is no lover but God. In the last analysis, human love for God and for anything else is God's love for himself. We, however, will never reach union with our true beloved until we wake up to our true nature. Now, reaching union, that is reestablishing the primordial unity that was the situation before God created 